I'm announcing the House of Representatives moving forward with an official impeachment inquiry. The actions of the Trump presidency revealed the dishonorable fact of the president's betrayal of his oath of office, betrayal of our national security, and betrayal of the integrity of our elections. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi had been blocking her feisty caucus from going ahead with impeachment, but the Ukraine whistleblower scandal was a tipping point for her and even moderate Democrats. This head-spinning turnabout comes just days after the idea of impeachment seemed dead, after the embarrassing fiasco of last week's Corey Lewandowski hearing. I'm Sam Roberts of The New York Times. Welcome to The New York Times Close Up. We'll talk impeachment politics in a moment. Also on tap, the fall Broadway season kicking off. Lynn manuel Miranda back on the boards with Freestyle Love Supreme. Okay. And improvis improv is a name. How do you say that? Improvis improv is improvisational. Thank you. Hip hop show where the audience throws out ideas. And Tina, the Tina Turner musical, that was easier, comes to Broadway, the show of it, the life of the rock goddess, still a smash hit in London. The Times chief theater critics will tell you what they're looking forward to this season. Plus, the Times dipped into its fast photo archives to take a look back at Dumbo, not the flying elephant, the iconic Brooklyn neighborhood. We'll show you lots of pictures. But we begin with politics, and stop me if you heard this one before. The latest Trump scandal is different. It's so egregious, even congressional Republicans may be turning on him. After all, Trump admitted on camera, and the transcript confirms, that he spoke to Ukraine's leader about investigating unverified corruption allegations about Joe Biden, his potential opponent, in the 2020 election. We don't want our people, like Vice President Biden and his son, creating to the, the corruption already in the Ukraine. Impeachment momentum seems unstoppable. So what's the bigger political risk for Democrats, impeaching Trump or not impeaching him? Christine Quinn, the former city council speaker, now vice chair of the New York State Democratic Party, Eleanor Randolph, contributing writer for The Times. She's also the author of The Many Lives of Michael Bloomberg. It was an editor's pick in last Sunday's Times book review. Christine, did Nancy Pelosi jump before she was pushed, or does she now really believe that impeachment is the way to go? You know, it's interesting, because I've heard, as it relates to Nancy Pelosi, some of the Republicans charging that she's steaming down the road of, of impeachment, kind of, you know, unbridled, which is not at all accurate, right? If you look at it, she's been, to the dismay of some of her members, incredibly thoughtful and methodical. I thought that she did it exactly correctly, because I felt like if she had waited till the transcript, waited for some more information, it... it it was reminiscent of how they handled the Mueller report. We're going to get the info that will answer all our questions. What she did was say, the facts are more concerning now. There's new info. It's info as it relates to a sitting president of the United States. We are now going to go find the facts and determine what they mean. And I think that was a real moment for her to take this into a strength-based leadership moment. For Eleanor, her. what was the pivot? What turned her toward impeachment? You know, I, I really think this, <clears throat> this whistleblower and this uh, Ukraine incident was much more important than the Republicans think it was. Yeah. I mean, for, for one thing, you're talking about the f a future election, and he's going after a future op uh, opponent, or we think he's going to be a future opponent. Um, Biden. It's, um, I, I can't see how Nancy Pelosi could have gone on much longer without starting an impeachment process because really, first of all, the impeachment process gives them more power to subpoena Trump. And they've, they've had all these subpoenas that have been bounced back and, you know, Trump says, we're not going to do that. Impeachment gives them more power to do that. Secondly, no matter what Trump says, they say, oh, this will help him, it'll turn him into a victim, you know, he's going to be, um, <clears throat> he's going to, this is going to help him in 2020. I, 
even if he says that, what this, the information that comes out, and if he gets impeached, he's with Bill Clinton, Richard Nixon, Andrew Johnson. It's not a great crowd. The other thing is the Trump's base is Trump's base, right? That 28, 30, 32, whatever you want to call it, is never moving. It hasn't moved. You know, I don't think that'll move. But there's not. And so they'll all go vote. Well, they, they all went and voted. Well, we don't know how many stayed home, and this time we'll come out and vote even more. I'm not worried about, as a Democrat, I'm not worried about his base. Mm -hmm. It is what it is. He won because he brought in people outside of his base. And this investigation, this impeachment process is exactly what is going to turn off, say, the white college educated uh, women in this country who got swept into the Trump Fuhrer. If we don't find out anything more than we already know, is that grounds for impeachment? He admitted, and his personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, admitted that he called a foreign leader and asked that foreign leader to investigate a political opponent, to get involved and intermingle in our election process. He has admitted it. It's almost like you don't need to do an inquiry. You can just, you know, the court, I'm just going to roll the tape. Uh, I think that's, he's damned himself just with that. And there are two other factors involved that seem to, uh, complicated even more. One, the question of aid to Ukraine, yes. which might have been yes. dangled over this. And two, now the question of cover-up, which is a word that uh, obviously the American public can understand very well. How does that play into it? You know, <clears throat> I think this is one issue. You know, the Ukraine issue is one really powerful way to go forward. It, it's like the tapes for Richard Nixon. And in fact, I keep wondering if, because all we got were these transcripts, if there are actually tapes of this conversation, uh, because the 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 so-called transcript transcripts were edited. They were bad enough. Right. You know, they really they sounded like. You know, it sounded like they were straight out of The Godfather. You know, you know, I like you. You're you're a great person. Your country's going to do really well. Well, that's well, how politics but, works, right? But, oh, please. I'm sorry, Christy. <laughs> but I need a favor. I need this favor. I need you to do this favor. And then if you have the, do the favor, you know, maybe things will go really well for you. I. I don't know. I don't. I think you have to be really dense not well, to get that. I was amazed that last week the president said. How would I do anything appropriate when I know people are listening in on the call? First of all, it turns out there were about 12 people <laughs> listening in on the call. How that happens, I don't quite understand. Secondly, I, I don't quite, although we may know this in the next day or two, what it means that the transcript was reconstructed. Mm. I'm not sure what it was reconstructed from uh, and how many people actually heard it and, as you say, whether it was indeed recorded or not. Well, maybe it was recorded by the Russians. We right, well, that's about a fact, that. yeah. Um, you know, uh, to go back to what you were saying, maybe Trump doesn't really understand how bad this is. I mean, it just, I mean, the fact that he put out the transcript and he did, it's as if he thinks, oh, well, why not, you mm. know? I mean, he said something like this to George Stephanopoulos a few months ago, you know. Uh, it's another real estate deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah you yeah, know, yeah. okay, somebody's going to say something bad about my opponent, I'll ask for it. Quick last question, when will the Republicans stand up and say, we're concerned about this? Well, I think one very potential answer is never. I think that they have had their spine surgically removed by Donald Trump. They live in a place of total fear. And I'm not sure they're going to switch kind of positions on that train. I hope I'm wrong. You know, I bet this is a perfect position for somebody who is really brave in the Republican Party and, you know, to make lots of news, lots of headlines. Well, I bet we'll see somebody. Profile and courage. Christine Quinn, Eleanor Randolph, thank you for joining us. And coming up next, Linda Vista, play by Pulitzer Prize winner Tracy Letts, one of a slew of promising entries this Broadway season. Times chief theater critics Ben Brantley and Jesse Green will weigh in on the season in a minute.
Now music is so disposable. I wanna feel close to you. Okay, I'm gonna great escape. I'm gonna give you my favorite mixtape. I will pick every song. Lynn Manuel Miranda returns to Broadway in Freestyle Love Supreme, an improvisational hip hop show with a limited engagement. Mary Louise Parker also returns to Broadway in The Sound Inside. Marisa Tomei stars in a revival of Tennessee Williams' The Rose Tattoo. And Slave Play, a deep dive into race and sexuality, also generating a lot of buzz. All that and a lot more coming to Broadway, plenty to talk about with New York Times chief theater critics Jesse Green and Ben Brantley. Wall-to-wall -wall jukebox musicals, Ben, you say. What is a jukebox musical? Well, there's been some debate about that. Generally, I think it's when, you, I mean, it, it's a pre-existing score, probably a pop score. I mean, otherwise you could say um, uh, Kismet is a jukebox musical, as has been, been pointed out. But uh, it takes two forms, essentially. It's the bio jukebox musical, and this season we have a, actually a great Adrian Warren because I saw it in London as Tina Turner. And then there's the sort of jukebox jukebox where songs are just sort of shoved in to, um, usually it's one artist uh, or like Girl from the North Country, the Bob Dylan musical is very different. Moulin Rouge is probably the ultimate jukebox musical because it really is, you know, if you just kept putting quarters in and banging the machine is sort of what would come out because it's songs from everywhere. You're not a great fan of jukebox musicals, are you, Jesse? That is an understatement. <laughs> yes, kudzu you like in the No, no, that was me. Who oh, called really? Oh, okay. <laughs> Even worse. Really? Jesse, yeah, that was in my little advanced piece. <laughs> Yeah, I, I find them to be, at best, backwards contraptions, trying to create scenarios and drama out of works that were never intended to carry dramatic weight. And there are rare occasions when they work. Uh, I think Girl from the North Country is, is one of those, but that's really the exception. Typically, you get stories that are nonsensical and performances that are in general, pale imitations of the originals. I mean, sort of the paradigm is Mamma Mia. That's what mm -hmm. started everything, I think. Uh, because, and that, I see that to me was kind of blissful because it was so insanely stupid. It just, it made, it's- But it was fun. It was great fun. And it was just after 9-11, as mm -hmm. you may recall, is when it opened, which I think was one of the reasons New Yorkers found such great comfort in it because it was, it was truly mindless. And I've seen other jukebox musicals that have been offensively mindless, but Mamma Mia to me was just, it was sweet, it was anodyne in the best possible way. It was a marshmallow of a musical. What else are you looking forward to this season? Jesse? Yes? Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned Slave Play in your yes. introduction there, and I think if you're talking about- Staggering, you called it. I called it staggering. It is staggering. It's even more staggering now, possibly, in that it's on Broadway. When I originally saw it, and Ben saw it as well, off-Broadway, at, at least it kind of was the thing that you might expect to see off-Broadway, a very daring play taking on contemporary issues of great importance in a sophisticated and kind of theater-bending way. Not the kind of thing you would ever dream would show up on Broadway, and it's a wonderful sign, uh, should it do well, of the possibilities that are out there for young playwrights who want to uh, make big statements right now. What does it say when a play like that moves to Broadway? That people are taking a chance? That times have changed? Both. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is a big chance. Uh, not only is it a play that is uh, difficult in its subject matter for some people, but it's difficult in its format as well mm -hmm. because it in involves a lot of kind of sleight of hand on the playwright's part about what it is. You can't really write very much about what it is without giving away. Although we're much. sort of used to that by now. I mean, yeah. you can t that can be done in a very conservative way, as in uh, The Height of the Storm, the new mm -hmm. Lauren Zeller play that Jesse trashed uh, rather accurately, <laughs> I thought, uh, <laughs> where, where perspectives change and you think you're seeing one thing and you... And you uh, I think one of the reasons it moved to Broadway is it does have the potential to be a succès de scandale. It is truly shocking, where is a play that I think would say is as good on a similar subject, Brandon Jacob Jenkins' Octoroon, would never move to Broadway. It's too eccentric and it doesn't show enough. Um, well, and, and it's a few more years yeah. later since that. That's very and, true too. Yeah. You know, they, they are working really hard to uh, improve the diversity of the audience for that show. And if they're able to do that, that's an incredible, an incredibly good thing for a the future A major achievement, of a necessary right. achievement, yeah. What are you looking forward to, Ben? What am I looking forward to? Uh, I'm looking for- On Broadway. On then. Broadway, right. 
I, I, I missed the inheritance whenever, it, I was always just missing it in London, so I'll be glad to have a, a chance to uh, catch up. It's the Matthew Lopez play of great ambition uh, that aspires to be this generation's Angels in America. Two parts. Two parts, six hours. Mm -hmm. yeah. Why, as both of you uh, wrote last week in uh, Arts and Leisure section, is Williamstown becoming such an incubator for Broadway shows? An incredible number. Yeah, well, uh, this season alone, they are sending seven recent shows, mm -hmm. either Broadway or off-Broadway, from their recent seasons. And part of it is that there's, uh, uh, they represent both the uh, model of an out-of-town tryout that used to be the, the regular way that shows got right. developed. Right, and New Broadway. Haven, yeah. Or whatever. Um, Why and, not uh, anymore? Why has that changed? Well, economically, it's become too difficult, uh, and also shows need uh, m more time, apparently, or creatives think they mm -hmm. need more time in between the performances and the time they came to New York. In the old days, you would do Boston, New Haven, Philadelphia, maybe Washington, two weeks in each, and then right to New York. And, and that's why we get all those great showbiz narratives about, yeah. you know, 42nd Street, we gotta change it, we're gonna change it on the road, you or know. Jerome kind of Robbins thing. saving. Right, right, right. Uh, what, uh, a funny thing happened on the way to the right. forum out of town. Um, now, what th this new system allows, and what Williamstown is quite brilliant at, is giving artists a lot of time to do workshops, readings, then a full production, far away enough from New York so that they're not gonna get ruined if it's not ready. And it and does attract the best actors, uh, great new playwrights. I think also their new artistic director has made Man it. Mandy yeah. Greenfield, who, who had been at the public for many years, was able to bring a lot of uh, younger and uh, you know, compelling new playwrights. You used well. to work there. Well. <laughs> In a manner of speaking. I, I was uh, a peon. Uh, many, many years ago, and it, uh, only briefly because I was let go, or I let myself go. I'm never sure what oh, really You didn't happened. stay for the entire summer? I was not invited to stay there, happily. Um, I got into oh trouble. Oh my God, I know that story. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a play in that? Right. Someday, oh, when, I, when I'm not invited to be at the Times anymore, I will perhaps better write. But, but it's a, the other aspect of Williamstown that that brings up, though, is that they are able to do more than a lot of other theaters can do because there's this large body of young people working there as apprentices and interns and, mm -hmm. and underlings of various kinds in both technical and other departments who are not being paid or being paid very little and help make top quality productions in the amount of time and with, with a l lower amount of money than you could do at a regional theater. Thanks to Ben Brantley, Jesse Green of the New York Times, and coming up next, we'll look back at the history of the Dumbo neighborhood in Brooklyn using some treasures from the Times photo archives. The Brooklyn neighborhood is called Dumbo, down under the Manhattan Bridge overpass, what was once a gritty area, now a tourist destination for people all over the world. Countless pictures of the view from Washington Street toward the Manhattan Bridge have been posted on Instagram. Photo editors at the Times' past tense team have dug up classic photos from the days before Dumbo was loaded with multi-million dollar condos, artisanal chocolate shops, in short, before it was cool. The Times' Jesse Wender is one of those photo editors. Jesse, how did you pick out the photos to use? There must have been thousands to choose from. Well, um, actually, there weren't thousands to choose from, so it was a very tricky subject to research. Um, because Dumbo is kind of a more modern name, we had a lot of difficulty locating images of this area. So, Because you weren't sure what to call it when you were looking. Yeah, so we ended up searching for images of Dumbo in many different folders. We looked in the Brooklyn Bridge folder, the Manhattan Bridge, Cadman Plaza, Brooklyn Heights, and then we ended up finding the photographs in some of the more strange folders like filming in New York or Art Deco. And the reason why I'm talking about finding images in folders is because one of the um, kind of the main impetus for our project is as the New York Times is digitizing their morgue or our photo archive, we're tasked with telling stories about the images. And 
three stories underground, several doors down from the Times, is the New York Times archive, which houses about four to six million prints. They're all physical prints stored in folders in army green cabinets. Um, and it's said that if um, these images and clippings were stored on a higher floor, it would buckle under the weight. There's just that many. What a treasure trove. Now, how did you pick the ones that uh, are in this collection? What's the common thread that ties them together? Well, you know, a lot of it kind of, the images end up coming from the different sorts of stories that the Times was covering about Dumbo at the time. So a lot of the images kind of carry tones of like what would run with a real estate story or with a food story, a metro story, and even arts and culture. So we tried to find a range in that, um, both these images that show the changing neighborhood, um, kind of the development that was happening at the area in the area, um, while trying to balance that with sort of interior views that kind of showed um, both artist studios, how people were living, the different sorts of... Um, bars that were popping up there at the time. So in the end, the collection that we chose, we tried to balance with more sort of beautiful, pulled back sort of cityscape views, as well as um, kind of intimate views of the people who were living there at the time. And of course, looking back to the 60s, 70s, even early 80s, a very different neighbor than it is today. When you look at pictures like this, obviously black and white pictures, color pictures, and now, of course, at nytimes.com video, we get different impressions. Uh, what do they tell us differently about a neighborhood like that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's been amazing kind of looking at this sort of analog time where um, a photographer would go out with a camera, shoot maybe a roll of film, two rolls of film, um, the images that are coming back are very different from maybe somebody who can go out and shoot 2,000 frames mm -hmm. in an hour. So I think a lot of that is kind of really thinking about um, maybe sort of a more sort of carefully selected process of what you're going to photograph. I, and I guess the video, of course, brings it to life in a very different way as well. Yeah, I mean, with video, you're, you have, you're able to kind of have a more sort of narrative quality. Mm -hmm. um, whereas with the still image, you're kind of left with this one kind of visual representation to kind of crystallize an idea, to accompany a story. Um, and many of our photographs, they feel like artworks now looking at them. Mm -hmm. But at the time, like really, you know, the goal was to sort of bring this image to make somebody want to read a story, to illustrate an idea of a story, um, while also being, you know, journalism right. in itself. And of course, online they are crystal clear. Uh, Dumbo coming up next, uh, filming in New York as well. Thanks to Jesse Wender for joining us, and I'll add my thoughts coming up on Coda next. Mayor de Blasio likes to look in the mirror and, like the evil stepmother in Snow White, ask, who's the fairest of them all? To the mayor, it's a rhetorical question. Last week, he volunteered his answer again. The results are in, he said. We have a safer and more equitable city today than we did even a year ago. He based his self-satisfied answer on the latest mayor's management report. The 400 pages of statistics suggest that a lot about the city is better, or at least no worse. Other than the tension over stop and frisk, the neglect of public housing and prisons, much of that trajectory was inherited from Mayor Bloomberg. But if the mayor took the time to parse those numbing statistics, he'd discover a compelling agenda for the two years left in his second term. Not to bore you with numbers, but city-owned vehicles were involved in 6,000 collisions last year, half of them preventable. Less than 3% of the 1,600 public school buildings are rated in good condition. Enrollment in half of them exceeds capacity. Inmate assaults on correction officers are increasing. 
the number of trees being pruned, inspected, removed, and planted has declined. The number of New Yorkers getting fatter is growing. So is the volume of sugary beverages they drink. Only half of high school graduates are considered ready for either college or a career. One in 14 prospective patients leave emergency rooms without ever being treated. When welfare recipients challenge the city's decision to cut their benefits, three in four of those decisions are overturned. Since 2015, the number of noise summonses issued has decreased from 8,000 to 1,000. Please, no statistic will persuade me that the city is getting quieter. If the noise is keeping you up at night, you can read the management report online at this address. For the New York Times and CUNY TV, I'm Sam Roberts.